Just ahead on Black Issues Forum, election season is here and a new initiative is shaking up the political landscape. Project 2025 is a bold plan that's got everyone talking, asking questions like, how is it going to impact the race for the White House? What do the candidates have to say about it? And what does it mean for the future of our nation and North Carolina residents? We'll get those questions answered next. Stay with us. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC. Welcome to Black Issues Forum. I'm Kenya Thompson. As the race for the White House intensifies and we wait for word on Trump's official opponent for the presidential race, Project 2025 has emerged as a significant point of debate and discussion. This ambitious initiative, with its bold vision and potentially impactful proposals, has captured the attention of candidates, analysts, and voters alike. But people are asking, what exactly is Project 2025 and why is it generating so much buzz? To help us better understand what's at stake, we've invited today's guests to provide insight on the issues. I'd like to welcome to the show Antoine Marshall, associate attorney at SCV Law Firm, and Devin Freeman, North Carolina's fourth district delegate. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Of Thank course. You. you know, there's a lot of talk about 2025. It's like we cannot escape it in the news, it feels like. Antoine, when we think about what we've heard, not a lot of people have read the document. I myself skimmed through it because it's a lengthy document. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Can you summarize what are the, the goals to this document? Why was it even created? So the Heritage Foundation, who is the organizing body who created Project 2025, um, every presidential cycle since Reagan, they have instituted what's called a mandate for leadership. Mm -hmm. This is the Project 2025 is the ninth mandate that they've done, or a version of this that they've done. Okay. Um, it is far more expansive than any of the other mandates for leadership, probably going back to the, except for the first one yeah. that they did with Ronald Reagan. Um, the goal of it is pretty simple. They're, they're trying to lay out what the conservative ideology is or their hopes for the next cons Republican commander in chief is. Mm -hmm. Um, now, it's important to realize, notice, and I know Trump has come out and said that he is not associated or affiliated All with right. Project 2025, but um, because they are a nonprofit organization, they can't officially coordinate with the campaign. Mm. So they can't officially say this is the plan for Trump or for a Trump presidency, even though that's exactly what it is. They're mm -hmm. planning for the next Republican president to get in office. So, you know, you've made a great point. They've made an argument that it's not necessarily a Republican thing. But, Devin, in your opinion, why, well, let me ask this question. Why is it even more important, I guess, this election cycle? Because you said this is the ninth iteration of something like this. Why is this so important this time? So, like, as you just said, like, every election cycle, each election cycle is important, but this is the most important one. When we talk about what uh, the Republican agenda, you see something similar to this document back in 1921. Mm -hmm. You also have 1973 as well as 1981. And what you see during these times and during those Republican administrations was something similar to uh, this document. And the thing is, this is when people look at it, this 900-page document of Project 2025, this isn't, when you hear that quote, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is what is happening. So you've had similar documentations like this in the past. That was a mandate for leadership for the Republican Party. And they used some of this as a strategy for going to the administration. But however, by the grace of God and luck, that these principles never actually got carried out to the full extent. Mm. And so, for instance, in the case that, uh, which probably wouldn't happen, Donald Trump becoming president, he wouldn't be able to take in all these initiatives such as like uh, taking out FEMA, uh, taking out the Department of Education, as well as all these other initiatives that are such deregulation and pullbacks on uh, of the American agenda. So when I look at that in itself, it's like this is just a Republican strategy that pulls us back rather than puts us forward. And that's why we need Kamala Harris in office so that her being president could push us forward. And I, say, I know you had talked about why this is so important and why there's so much e emphasis on this mandate versus the other ones. Again, uh, you, you talked about the length of it. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably the broadest stroke they have, like I said, going back to the Reagan administration. I mean, it is over 900 pages of policy ideas. And again, as they, though they tried to distance themselves from it, um, the 
Project 2025 is broken down into 30 chapters, right. um, each one covering a different um, department within the, in the administration. 25 of them were written by somebody who served in either the first Trump administration, administration. or his transition team. Okay. Right. So as much as he distances himself from it, the odds are that these are going to be the same people who would serve in a second Trump administration. Okay. Correct. And then also what you see is uh, J.D. Vance. He also wrote a forward for the next book that also talks about Project 2025 as well. Okay. So as much as you see the can Republican campaign, like, distancing itself from Project 2025 and also Donald Trump coming on uh, coming on air saying that he's not a part of it at all is a lie because more than anything is that you have part of your administration from before that's connected to Project 2025. You also just saw recently that the president just stuck the president of the Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. just stepped down because of issues that, that Project 2025 has done for the Republican campaign. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're starting to see because the DNC is starting to combat that, talking about what is Project 2025 and letting it being aware because this has to be put on notice. Like, this is something that not only pushes African Americans but also other coalitions and also other minorities, and it crosses more than just race but also class. Right. So when you're putting the working class man and woman behind rather than pushing forward and actually protecting labor rights, this is an issue for all working Americans. Well, let me ask a question. So, like you said, Trump's camp has distanced themselves. Kamala, and before Biden stepped down, he as well, were acknowledging it, talking about how, um, obviously, this would not be a thing if they were to hold office. But let's break it down. If we have more right-wing representatives um, in the House, can this still be adopted even though we choose a, a democratic president so uh yes it, it can be adopted in certain ways and we've actually seen some of policy to, uh, Pro project 2025 being enacted in other ways right. um this past supreme court term uh, one of the major goals of project 2025 is to dissolve what they call the administrative state mm -hmm. and so the way that the federal government has run since probably the 80s um, has been through the administrative state. The departmental agencies would help regulate things. So just take like the Clean Air and Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. It would give the EPA broad power to enact, you know, to, to control and make sure that we get clean air and clean water. Mm -hmm. So basically the Clean Water Act would say you can't dump pollutants into the river. And then it's up to the EPA to say, okay, what's a pollutant? you know, how much is, is legally safe for, for people. And so that's been the administrative state and that we've operated under for a long time. Um, this recent Supreme Court decision, which again is not associated with the presidential race at all, but they overturned what was called the Chevron Doctrine, which basically gave those administrative agencies the right to say, hey, this is a pollutant. This is what, you know, you can't dump this and have the authority. And then basically the Chevron Doctrine says, we're going to defer to the EPA to decide what's a pollutant and how to we interpret these uh, congressional statutes. Um, the Supreme Court overturned that and basically said judges will now have the ability to determine. And so uh, there was another case that came before the Supreme Court um, in which they were talking about the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. And Neil Gorsuch basically said that the EPA doesn't have a right to say whether or not nitrous oxide is a um, is a pollutant right. and those those are the decisions that are going to have massive impact even outside of who who, uh, who wins office as far as the executive mm -hmm. just as far as the judicial branch so while project 2025 talks about the playbook for what the executive can do because again they're doing a lot as far as hiring at those agencies or undermining or getting rid of some of those agencies as Devin talked about they're still also talking about putting people on the bench mm -hmm. and the Heritage Foundation has been very influential as far as getting our judges. Yeah. Um, so even outside of who's the executive, because this is the playbook for what the executive can do, there's still policy ideas as far as how conservatives want to run the country, how they want to run government. Well, let me, let's start digging into some of the ideas around policy. So the first one I want to talk about is cuts to Social Security and Medicare, which, you know, there's rumors that by the time I'm ready to retire, I might not be able to retire because there may not be any funds unless I've saved some on my own. So let's talk about some of the specific changes that are being suggested for Social Security and Medic Medicare. So when you look at uh, Social Security first, what, what you see within the document for Project 2025 is the increase of age for people to re retire in order to take out on Social Security. So what you're going to see is age of 70. So, and they, the proponents of this, 
the reason why they want this is regards of when you increase the the age in regards to requirement, you're going to have less and less people uh, be able to get to that and be able to use the advantage of it in regards to just uh, being able to take it out. And then when we talk about Medicare and Medicaid and particularly what you start seeing for Medicare is the instance of not being able, you're starting to see 21 people, 21 million people is going to be affected if uh, we end Medicare or take away some of the uh, regulations of it. Mm -hmm. And then what you're also going to see is about, uh, pre existing conditions. Yeah. So you're going to see 100 million people affected by that as well. Yeah. And so when you talk about these two entities, these are two major entities that uh, Americans rely on. And so what does it look like? Because even myself, I have family members and friends who would be affected by this. So you're telling me that you're taking away their. A right that they should be able to uh, being able to have affordable health care from them mm -hmm. and it's just so interesting because now we talk about Social Security and I think about my parents my parents are in their mid 50s and to think that my mom's gonna have to be able, have to work all the way to her 70s yeah. and then it's interesting because even with my grandparents they're still around thank God but they're able to retire at 50 and because of that I was able to like enjoy their time even when I was younger I remember them when who they are and I'm and I swear to God if they were working, I don't think I'd be able to see them as much as I do now. Indeed. So, I mean, indeed, we have to talk about how this not only affects our generation, but also the our kids and our grandkids in the future. Yeah, talk about and, quality of life, essentially. And I think it's important that this be in the Black Issues Forum when we talk about how these policies impact African Americans. Um, that raising of the age, um, it, it does have a racial impact because African Americans on average live, live about seven years less than our white compatriots. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about raising that age, that means less African Americans are going to enjoy the benefits of the money that they put into Social Security. Mm -hmm. um, but privatizing Social Security has been a cornerstone of right-wing philosophy for a while. Um, it has been a goal to try to eliminate Social Security or to privatize it and basically make individuals responsible for their own retirement savings and plans. Right. And there was a reason why Social Security w was put in place in the first place was because for a lot of people, they did not have the money to live out the rest of their days. I mean, they ended up running out of money. And um, that was the reason why Social Security was implemented, was to provide a quality of life for our seniors. Yeah. Um, there's a saying you can always tell um, what a government does as far as taking care of its, the least among them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're youngest and they're oldest. Yeah. And so I think by getting rid of Social Security, you're going to impact a lot of lower income individuals. You're going to impact a lot of minorities, mm -hmm. again, because statistically, we just don't live as long yeah. because of yeah. other reasons. And speaking of that impact to those individuals, Millions of people are under the Affordable Care Act. That's another piece that is proposed to be taken away. You mentioned pre-existing conditions. That's going to come back. I remember struggling that my, with that myself years and years ago, not being, be, being able to be approved for surgery or procedures simply because it fell under a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. What is that going to look like if that goes away for these millions of Americans that are underneath the Affordable Care Act now, black people in particular? You're going to see a lot of people who are denied access to health insurance. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, these, these laws are put in place for a reason. And sometimes, I mean, as we get further away from the problems, we forget about how bad our insurance, or our insurance was um, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, I think I was, when the Affordable Care Act was initially passed, I was allowed to stay on my parents' insurance until I hit 25, which allowed me to go to law school and not have to worry about what my health insurance looked like or covering that. Um, I do have a pre-existing condition. Um, I have narcolepsy, mm. which would prevent me from potentially getting insurance. And we've, we've seen cases where uh, insurance companies have denied people for being child, for childhood obesity. Yeah. And so we saw the impact of COVID and people with pre-existing conditions were the ones who were hardest hit by COVID. Mm -hmm. And so we, we know what the impact of, of this is going to be if, if we remove millions of people off of health insurance, um, if we allow insurance companies to decide who gets health insurance, because again, while health insurance is a great option, it's a, great, it's a necessary um, for society, mm -hmm. we also realize that um, insurance companies, they're designed to make money. And the easiest way to make money is to cut the people who end up being the most expensive. And those are people with pre-existing conditions, people who are going to, you know, uh, the lifetime cap is another aspect of the Affordable Care Act that people don't realize that prior to the Affordable Care Act, if you use too much 
health care, mm -hmm. they said, you know, you are too expensive, they would cut you. Yeah. And so the people who need it the most would have the least access to it. And while we're talking about all this, I just want to make sure viewers understand that the purpose of today's conversation is just to clearly s pull out some of the proposals that are being um, put out with this Project 2025 document. We're not leaning one way or the other. Obviously, there's, um, you know, feelings around a lot of it, but this is just simply stating what's been proposed. Nothing has been enacted. Nothing is in in motion quite <laughs> yet, officially. Yeah, yeah. There's some bills um, out there. There's, there's, been, there's, there's some, some things. And, and so that brings me to abortion, right? Okay. So we did see the overturn of Roe v. Wade a couple of years ago. Abortion has been a hot topic conversation over and over again ever since. It's part of the proposal. It is in there. Well, Devin, share with us what that proposal looks like when it pertains to abortion. Right. Uh, so abortion is an important topic across the country as as of now. And it's interesting was I was there when uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned back in the summer of 22. I was working in Congress actually. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting is from now until from then until now, what we're starting to see within this proposal is that what they're first first and foremost they're trying to get away with uh, the abortion pills. So doing rollbacks and deregulation in that aspect. Another thing too is the Comstead Act that they're trying to impasse. So what that specifically would do would be like, say for instance that you get some of your medication through the mail, they would roll back on that too because you have a good percentage of Americans that rely on that. You rely on U.S. mails as well as other entities in order to get that and be able to use that medication. Right. And so we talk about that and then also having more of an increased uh, reasons of abortion across the country. So the thing is this is that why is it that we're having, we're taking the woman's right to choose when it should be in her decision rather than putting in politician decisions? Because I think about, you know, if I have a future daughter or even just my wife and itself, and I just can't imagine of just current Americans that are dealing with it now, just like not being having an abortion, and that puts in the risk of the uh, woman itself. Right. So, I mean, we're now we're just talking about life over death. And so, yeah, you brought up the Comstock Act, which is a... It, it's already a law. It's, it's, it's an unused law. It has not been used in a long time, but they're trying to utilize the Comstock Act to prevent, as you said, um, abortion medication mm -hmm. from being shipped um, mm -hmm. across state lines or being shipped at all. Mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also illegal to transport it across state lines. So mm -hmm. if you drive across the border in order to, a state border, in order to get an abortion medication and bring it back to your own state, you are now committing a And felony. just to be clear, these are all things that are currently... It, the, so the Comstock Act is a current law. Yes. It's just not utilized. So it's not used. So they're trying to utilize that in order to create, essentially make it impossible to get an abortion. Because, not, it, because, because it would be illegal to ship it, again, if a doctor's office were to order it from another state, it would now be illegal. If you were to drive across the border, if you're in a state that does not allow access to abortion and you drive across to a state that does and you bring that medication... And I, I think it's important to realize most abortions in this country are medical, are medicated. Right. I mean, it's through a pill. It's not, you know, an invasive surgery or anything like that. Um, and so that is the, the, and again, relating this back to how it impacts African Americans, um, mm -hmm. we have the highest maternal mortality rate in the world. Mm -hmm. And for black women, it is three times higher than for our, for our, our, their counterparts. And so when we talk about, as you said, you know, a woman's right to choose, a woman's right to choose her health care, um, we have major problems in black women being able to deliver children safely mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading a statistic and they said that, you know, if you made, if you compared a black woman giving birth to any other job in America, it would be the second most dangerous job in the country, mm. just from the mortality rate of how many African-American women passing away, you know, so I, I think that it's important to realize the danger that women face, particularly black women, right. in, in their reproductive choices and health care. Mm -hmm. And so when we start talking about limiting access to abortion medication, limiting access to family planning, because part of the Comstock Act and what they define as an abortion medication, some of it is just birth control. Yeah. You know, Plan B would be considered um, under strict reading of the statute. Right. And so we're not just talking about abortion, we're also talking about access to family uh, family planning medication. Mm -hmm. 
about five minutes left in the show, and I want to make sure that we kind of talk about the voter impact, because there's a lot. If we wanted to sit here <laughs> and yeah. talk about this <laughs> proposal, day. Day. I mean, we have education <laughs> that we hadn't touched. Critical race theory is mm -hmm. in there, b banned books in there. Um, and then when we talk about safety, there's, there's a lot in there. So we encourage you, if you haven't taken a look for yourself, please go read the document, take a look. Um, but let's, let's talk about the, what this information is going to do to voter turnout, black voter turnout. Before Biden stepped down, there was conversation about are, are black people going out to vote? Mm -hmm. We've seen Kamala change those numbers drastically, even without an official announcement that she is going to be running. How do you think Project 2025 is going to impact or is it going to impact voters at all in their decision making? I think the more people know about Project 2025, the more it influences them to go out and vote. Um, I think that's why you see Trump and J.D. Vance trying to distance themselves from it at this point, because they know that a lot of those ideas are very, very unpopular. The more they talk about the ideas, the more people realize. And I think it's going back to, you know, when it when Trump was for his first term when he tried to get rid of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And when they rolled out what, what their plan was, it was very unpopular, and that's why it never went through, because people, you know, realized how bad it was. And so when we see... When we see the Trump campaign out on the campaign trail, he speaks very vaguely about policy. You know what? I don't think he, he... He's not really in tuned in policy. So we know that a lot of the policies that would come into a second Trump administration would come from these outside sources of people who are associated with Project 2025. So we can see the details of policy. We see how unpopular they are. And I think the more people know about it, the more likely they are to show up to vote, mm -hmm. and which is why they're trying to distance themselves. I think the Heritage Foundation two days ago said they're actually going to shut down the policy wing of Project 2025. Mm -hmm. And I think the other important part about Project 2025, yes, there's this 900-page document of their policies, but I think the other dangerous part that people are not paying as much attention to is Project 2025 is supposed to be creating kind of a LinkedIn for conservatives. Mm. And so they're trying to vet over 10,000 potential federal employees based solely off of their adherence to conservative philosophy. Yeah. And basically give them training so that once if they do, if they are able to win the White House, that they have a list of federal employees that they can bring in. Because a lot of what Trump wanted to do in the first administration was stop by those career federal employees who said, this isn't a good idea. We need to, to roll this back. And so now they're trying to, again, part of Project 2025 is to kind of purge those people, the federal employment, and, and try to bring in people of like-minded philosophy. So I, I hope the more people learn, the more yeah. it incentivizes them to vote. Devin, you represent our young, younger votes. <laughs> How do you feel like young votes are going to potentially change things? Right. To also speak on what Marcus said as well, as what you saw last week, and well, after Kamala, Harris, after uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden stepped down and Kamala Harris entered the race, what you started seeing was just a surge of new energy. Mm -hmm. And then the energy was this is that you had an older man, Joe Biden, to step down and say, hey, I'm going to pass the baton to the next generation. And you see Kamala Harris take off. And so what's interesting is like you see a whole shift in regards to Gen Z and then as well as like other demographics, demographics other than Gen Z, as you start seeing so many people, black women, 44,000 black women organized, raised millions of dollars. You also see the black men come behind as well as raise just about over a million as well. And then also you start seeing uh, different Zoom strategy meetings, such as like white dudes for Kamala Harris, and then you start seeing white women for Kamala Harris, as well as other demographics as well. And what you're starting to see is this generation, this uh, overall amount of money, more than $80 million the campaign has been able to raise, you're starting to see that this by itself so is what the movement is, and it's led by a grassroots movement. And so what you're starting to see, and you just saw this at the, the other day at a Kamala Harris a campaign rally back in uh, in Houston, or, I mean, Georgia, Georgia. Atlanta. Atlanta yeah. yeah, and you start seeing just, like, uh, <laughs> people talk about why did Megan Stein, why they use her to be there. And that's because you have to see what is the cultural relevancy, and the campaign knows that. And that's what you're starting to see youth get behind, because they recognize that this is the platform, unlike uh, Trump, doesn't have a clear uh, policy platform. You see Kamala Harris does. You see what she's been able to do, being qualified, being able to be a district attorney, attorney general, U.S. senator, and now being the vice president. Yeah. This woman is more than qualified and understands the youth. The youth understands that, and that's why they're getting behind and backing her. And so when we talk about the voter turnout itself, we're about to push out in the different swing states, and I believe we can win the election.
Yeah. And, you know, it's so important that people get out there and vote. And a lot of voter misinformation is out there. Yes. So we've got a graphic that we want people to take a look at, scan as Election Day gets closer and we get closer to, to making that vote. We want um, our viewers to know that PBS North Carolina wants you to be prepared so that you vote with information and you vote smart um, voter registration information voter day in day of vote information deadlines early voting voter voter id there's so much information if you go to pbsnc.org vote for additional details or scan the qr code if you are able to do so it's so important that we exercise our ability to vote it is any last thoughts or words Devin antoine that you guys have for those who just need to to vote one person that told a 35 seconds. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. I would say this more than anything is the change that we want to see starts with our right to exercise, our right to vote, as well as doing other things within the community to bring the community together. When you see throughout the history of this nation is that when we show up, we can make change. And that's what it's all is about. So that's the call to action, not only to the youth, but also the older generation as well, because we see through collective action itself, yeah. through collective bargaining, we can make the change and push forward what's push us forward in the right direction. Great it. Devin Freeman, Antoine Marshall, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank and we you. thank you for watching the show. If you want more content like this, we invite you to engage with us on Instagram using the hashtag Black Issues Forum. You can also find our full episodes on pbsnc.org slash Black Issues Forum and on the PBS video app. I'm Kenya Thompson. I'll see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.